So over to you, Nick, with your uh, talk about building a simple receiver. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, lovely to see you. And um, uh, thank you very much to Tristan for um, in inviting me um, to and um, letting me loose <laughs> on your uh, respective radio clubs. Um, now, hopefully you're seeing my title screen. Is that? Yeah. Yep, brilliant. Yep, brilliant, thank you. Um, yes, so um, well, <clears throat> my uh, name is uh, Nick, and the Q Church here is uh, Bournemouth on the on the south coast. And uh, just a word of introduction about me: I'm a bit of a Johnny Come Lately, really, to, to amateur radio. It has to be said, uh, I've only been licensed for uh, three years, um, but I've always been interested in in radio and, and electronics and uh tinkering around with all that stuff um and i quickly discovered i mean amateur radio we say you know is, is a hobby of a thousand hobbies isn't it there's so many different aspects to it that you could spend your whole life just looking at all these these different kind of rabbit holes you could jump down but i quickly discovered that my um particular interest was was building radios and um uh, and uh, that kind of home brewing thing um, was something that, that fascinates me. Um, uh, now, I should say from the, the outset, I am by no means an expert, <laughs> right? Let me just put that out there. Uh, I am the amateur in amateur radio, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I have no formal training in electronics or, or engineering or, or any of that stuff. As a matter of fact, I'm a vicar. <laughs> Uh, the NTV in my call sign stands for Nick the Vic. I'm actually a method, an ordained minister in the Methodist Church, um, following the noble tradition of ecclesiastical um, home brewers. Um, so, um, so this is a hobby, um, uh, 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 but it's just something that, that fascinates me, um, and um, where people are uh, kind enough to uh, to uh, indulge me in talking about my passion for building radios, then I try and uh, take them up on it. So what I want to talk about tonight, actually, is, is really about the way that I build radios, which is actually really important because it can actually make a really complicated project doable. Um, it, the way I approach is this business, uh, what we call modular um, uh, uh, approach to, to building radios, which essentially just means taking what could be a big complex project and chopping it up breaking it down into smaller, doable, bite-sized chunks um, that you can uh, complete perhaps over an evening or a weekend, um, uh, and then putting all these chunks together and, and, and producing um, a, a radio. And we're going to take a concrete example of, of uh, something that I've built specifically for this talk. And during this talk, you'll see bits of video. There's lots of photos and pictures and schematics and all kinds of other stuff, um, which hopefully um, will um, keep you interested. <laughs> and um, just to say as well, uh, there is a PDF version of this uh, talk available, and I can make that available. And there's some other stuff um, that I can make available as well that I'll say a bit more about um, as we go on. But um, right, well, uh, let's uh, crack on with it then. Now, let's just see if this is going to work. No, I have to kind of click it there first. Right. So um, when I say building, um, what do I mean? Well, um, I mean scratch building, um, not assembling a kit. Now, let me just put out a, a, a word of kits. Um, there's nothing wrong with kits. Kits are great. Right. I've built many, many kits. And I still enjoy building kits. Um, and actually, what I would say, and I've no idea who I'm talking to um, uh, tonight. You know, you, you could all be seasoned home brewers who've been building things for years and years and years. Or there may be people here who, who are not, you know, who are, who are more just starting out on this journey and perhaps just interested in it. And really, it's to you guys that I'm talking um, primarily. So I, I apologize if I'm preaching to the converted. Um, but really, the aim is to encourage people to, to kind of have a go. Uh, at some of this stuff. But what I would say is if you've really done no electronics construction at all, 
you might just want to forget some of this stuff I'm talking about tonight and go away and buy some kits and build them, right? So get used to wielding a soldering iron. Get used to reading resistor color codes. Get used to, you know, putting your transistors in the right way round, you know, all, all those kind of things. Because you can hone some useful skills by doing that stuff, which will set you in, in good stead. And the great thing about building a kit is you have instructions. Someone's prepared usually a PCB for you. All the parts are there for you. What I'm going to be talking about tonight is a step up from, from that. There's nobody holding your hand in the way that you, you get when you build a kit. So you're going to be starting from scratch. You're going to be sourcing components. You're going to be designing, producing your own boards. Um, now, this can seem daunting uh, at first um, because you think, oh, you know, uh, you know. but actually it, it, it's an amazing uh, experience and amazingly empowering actually when you can get a handle on some of this stuff because it's your build it's your design you can do anything you want right you know and once you get the confidence to do this um uh, it, it's a great building block that you can use to go on to to do some to do some other things as well but the one thing i would say is although the kind of building that i'm going to be talking about tonight is not the kind of stuff that comes with a with a full instruction set I found that the amateur radio homebrew community are some of the kindest and friendliest people that I've ever met, you know, in, in my life. And I correspond regularly with people literally all over the world about this kind of stuff. And people are very generous um, uh, of their time and their expertise and their, their encouragement. So, you know, there's plenty of help out there. And there's plenty of people who are willing to, to help if you're willing to, 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 to put a bit of effort in and to, and to give it a go. Uh, and so I would say that. Um, so, you know, there are people on hand uh, uh, when you need to shout for help, and we all need to shout for help sometimes. Okay, now I'm showing you that because that was the most recent major build that I've completed. That actually is a tri-band um, phasing SDR transceiver. Works off a, a tiny little teensy 3.2 microcontroller. It has a, a flashy TFT screen down there with a spectral display and a waterfall. It has eight different software selectable uh, Hilbert trans, uh, transform filters. It's got loads of bells and whistles in, right? It's the most complicated thing I've built, right? Now, usually when I'm giving talks like this, I'm giving talks about building transceivers. That's what I do, really. That's my thing, building SSB transceivers. But, and the pro but the problem is, when, if, if I do a talk about something like this, people look at this, right, and I explain it, and they all think, oh, wow, that's really cool. That's amazing. That must have taken you ages. But then what a lot of people often say is, ah, but I could never do that. That's way above my ability. I could never do that in a million years. You know, uh, and, and, and the, the problem is, is sometimes... I think I'm, I'm I'm actually being a disincentive to people. <laughs> so um, uh, the, the truth is, it wasn't very long ago when I would have looked at that and said, I could never do that. And I didn't just wake up one day and decide to build an SSB transceiver. You know, what I did is exactly what I'm going to be talking to you guys about tonight. You know, I started small and I started modular, right? And actually, some of these building blocks that we're going to be thinking about tonight are fundamentals in this rig that you see before you here. I couldn't have built this thing if I hadn't, first of all, mastered these essential building blocks that we're going to be talking about. And once you get those blocks down, right, you can build just about anything you want, right? So that's the last time you're going to see a transceiver tonight because we're, we're going way, way back, way, way more basic than, than, than that this evening. Um, so what I want to say, and this is the essential message really, is to build big, think small. Think small. What I mean is that it's actually possible to think of all analog radio receivers as simply different combinations of the same basic building blocks or modules. And I'm going to suggest to you in a moment there are four. There are only essentially four building blocks. Now, these are big, wide, generic terms, and, and you'll see what I mean in a minute, but essentially there are. And, and by designing and building in this modular fashion, breaking it down into small bite-sized chunks, then you can take a larger and more complex thing like a transceiver or super head or whatever, you know, and, and actually break it up into smaller doable chunks that you can achieve. Now, there's several advantages to, to this approach, and I've, I've listed three there. First of all, 
And this is important because let's remember, you know, this is supposed to be a hobby, folks. <laughs> you know, we do this stuff for fun, right? You know, you get a regular sense of satisfaction at completing something. You know that idea, that thing when you've you've you've, you've worked at something and you've done it, right? It's like, oh, I've achieved this, right? And the trouble with building one huge complicated project is it might take you weeks, months, years to complete, right? And if it's all out on one big board, you plug it, the chances of it actually working are pretty minimal, you know. Um, uh, whereas actually, if, if you can do a small bit, right, you can feel good that you've built a bit of it. You may not have built the whole radio, but you've built a bit of it, right? And that's really important. Secondly, it's far easier to test and to fault trace single modules than it ever is to test one huge big thing. Because if you've got a problem, you've got loads of modules and you, you haven't tested each individual one your problem could be anywhere and it's it's hellishly difficult sometimes to trace down exactly what it is and it's not always obvious and it's not always where you think it is um but actually if you can build a small bit you can test that small bit right and get it working and if it doesn't work right spend some time on it figure out why it's not working try something different you know um and, and once you've got that bit working then you put that bit aside then you want to build another bit right and then you you take that bit you you test that then you put that with the original bit you did you know and that's how you build it up now the advantage of this is there's a great flexibility of design, right? When you can rearrange modules, you can swap them in and out. So let's say, for instance, you build a bandpass filter, and you build this bandpass filter, and it's all right, you know, you're pleased with it. But you see another design for a different design for a bandpass filter, and you think, I wonder if that one works better than the one I built. Yeah, well, awesome. build it, <laughs> you know, build it and find out, right? And if you like it better, swap it out and put yours in. Right? Or, or maybe you're wondering, maybe I, I, I should put this amplifier before the filter or after the filter or what? Well, try it. And the, the thing is, if, if you've got them all separate modules, you can swap them around and actually um, make a decision before you want to hardwire it all in together. So it, I would really commend this modular approach uh, to building now okay so what are my four basic building blocks okay here you are so i'm suggesting pretty much any analog radio can be constructed from these four wide generic building blocks you have filters you have mixers you have oscillators and you have amplifiers now i know what some of you are thinking there's many different types of amplifiers. Yes, there are. There's many different types of mixers. There's different types of filters. I, there are. But, you know, just go with me on this. Essentially, when you think about it, um, there may be different flavors of all these things, but essentially pretty much any analog radio can be built using these four, um, uh, these four building blocks. Um, right, okay. So we're going to build a direct conversion receiver. Why? Because this essentially is just those four blocks I showed you, nothing else. One example of each of those four blocks put together will get you a direct conversion receiver. And it is the simplest way. Now, I know I could have rocked up here and, and built a crystal set. You probably wouldn't have been that impressed <laughs> with, with that. Um, but I'm talking about the simplest way you're going to um, uh, demodulate um, a single sideband and listen to the amateur bands will be a direct conversion receiver. So that's what we're going to do. So here's a direct conversion receiver. This is what it is. You have your antenna, which goes to a bandpass filter. And that bandpass filter takes your, your RF. Now, we're going to be building for uh, 80 meters. So, uh, so your 80 meter signal comes into your product detector. But look, it's just a mixer. The only difference is it's a mixer that mixes down to baseband, to audio. And, uh, and a mixer is a three port device. So it has two inputs and one output. So one input is your RF. The other input, comes from your local oscillator. And so that will produce then your sum and your different frequencies. Now, it, this, it's a double balanced mixer. So what that means is it will attenuate those two input signals. So it will attenuate um, very effectively. Usually the, the local oscillator signal, it will attenuate less effectively the RF, um, but because the RF is a much lower uh, um, uh, amplitude anyway, that's not really a problem. And that will give you um, your uh, uh, audio signal at the other end, which we're going to amplify in our audio amplifier, and then we're going to squirt that out, technical term, into our loudspeaker. So that's basically the design of the direct conversion receiver. Now, how does it work? Hand on heart, 
This is the only slide with RF theory in the whole talk. And so if this doesn't float your boat, just zone out for the next few minutes, <laughs> right? Okay, I won't be offended. Um, but if it does, and to be honest with you folks, this is, I love this stuff. This is why I build radios. I build radios so I can understand how they work. And um, uh, because people, that's it. now I built, the first thing, the first major build I did was 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 a direct conversion receiver and, and anyone that's ever built one or listened to one will know um that you, when you listen to it there's there's some you can hear your signal but there's some strange stuff going, there's kind of other stuff cutting across it and, and 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 when you ask the question you why does it sound like this the answer that you're usually given is well the thing about a, a, a direct conversion receiver is it receives on both side bands at once i didn't understand this at all i thought hang on a minute I'm on 80 meters. How many people are on upper sideband on 80 meters? There is only lower sideband. I, cannot, you know, I just didn't get it, right? So for all the people like me that didn't get it, I hope this is helpful. And for everybody else, don't worry about it. Um, so, um, so here's how it works. We have our, um, our product detect. So let's say we've got um, a three kilohertz signal uh, on 80 meters. So it's going to sit between 3697 and 3700 kilohertz. And um, our uh, local oscillator is going to put uh, in a signal of 3700. So what that means is that we will get out the product. It's about multiplication. Um, so we will get the sum, which is the RF frequency plus the local oscillator. And you'll see that that will give us a signal which is sitting just north of the top end of the 40 meter band. We don't need to worry about that because uh, we're going to be filtering out the um, the the RF anyway because we're only interested in the audio because it's a direct conversion. So what we're interested in is the difference. So that's the RF minus the LO. Incidentally, it doesn't have to be RF minus LO. You can you say LO minus RF. You, the, the mixer doesn't know what it's supposed to be minus in for what, right? Um, but I would encourage you when you're working this stuff out to start with the RF, and you'll see why in a minute. So what we get, the difference frequency, um, it, uh, the 3700 minus 3700 gives us naught DC. Yeah, well, that makes sense. But hang on a minute. 3697 minus 3700 is minus 3 kilohertz. You think, how the heck can you have minus 3 kilohertz? Well, you can't, of course. Well, you can mathematically. I mean, that's, that's the truth. But in reality, there's no such thing as minus 3 kilohertz. It's just 3 kilohertz. But that minus, this is why I said start with the RF, that minus tells us something very important. You'll see what in a minute. So here we go. So you've probably seen these things before. So let's say we've got our lower sideband signal there. And uh, th now this little green triangle, the, the narrow bit by the 3700, that's indicating that the, uh, the lower uh, uh, frequencies of the, the modulated audio are there and the higher frequencies are at the 3697 end. So actually, that tells you something about lower sideband. It's inverted to start with. So it's the opposite because you, you've got the, the highest frequencies lowest in the band, if you see what I mean, right? So that's, that's just how lower sideband is. And as we know, upper sideband will just be the mirror image uh, of that. So that's our, that's our signal. Um, and so once it's gone through um, uh, the mixer, what happens is, is it goes to that, right? So it goes to naught to minus three, but as I've said, that's not possible. So what happens in reality? Now, look carefully. Here we go. Three, two, one, it goes around the, and it swings around. It folds around that DC level to sit at naught to three. Now, but just look. Right, happy days. Now we've got our lower sideband signal, right? Properly inverted with the low signals down the bottom end and the high signals at the top end. So, so great, you know, what are we worrying about? Well, what we're worrying about is that that's brilliant, but unfortunately, 3697 to 3700 is not the only uh, bandwidth of frequencies that will give us a signal between naught and three. So if we happen to have an upper sideband signal, for instance, um, what would happen would be uh, that would actually mix down to the same. And there's no there's no inversion with the uh, with upper sideband. But you say, as I said, we're on 80 meters. Who's on upper sideband? Well, quite. There's there's not. But what you probably will have, and particularly if it's a crowded band, maybe on a contest weekend or something, what you probably will have 
is another lower sideband signal sat three kilohertz above it. And what happens is, is that because it's occupying the upper sideband slot, that's why people say it receives on both sidebands, that will mix down just as it is on top of the signal that you're listening to. So what you'll in fact hear when you tune with your direct conversion receiver is you'll hear the signal that you want to listen to. You'll also hear an inverted form of whatever is lying three kilohertz above it, right? Which is probably a lower sideband. So it sounds like upper sideband over the top of what you're listening to, right? Now, there's nothing you can do about that, folks. Blame physics. <laughs> That's just how it is. Um, the only thing you can do is to change your direct conversion receiver into something else, like a super head you know, that, that, that has an intermediate frequency that you mix down to. Then you filter out that upper three kilohertz so that when you come to mixing it down, there's nothing there. To, to, to go over to the top of, of what you've got there. But that's another talk for another day. It, uh, and, and seriously, that is another talk for another day if, you, if you're interested. What I've actually done is a modification to this design to convert it into a super head as well. But, uh, but that's about it. Anyway, okay, let's get on with it. That's enough theory. Um, so um, homebrewing wisdom advises us um, that we build backwards. So what I mean is you start at the back end and you work your way forward. So uh, we're going to start with the audio amp then the product detector, then the local oscillator, and then the bandpass filter. So here we go. So block number one is the audio amp. Now, here it is. Now, I could have produced a nice, um, you know, computer-generated graphic, but I thought, no, you know, this is far more realistic. This is what I do when I'm designing something or I'm copying it from a, a, something on the internet or whatever. You know, I'll do it in pencil. A very good idea to use pencil, actually, because if you make a mistake, <laughs> or you change your mind or you want to change the value of that capacitor or something, it's far easier to rub it out and start again, you know, and so I'd, I'd really kind of advise that. Um, so, so this is what we're going to use now. It's using a ubiquitous little LM386, which I know is not the best, um, but it's simple and it's cheap and it's readily available. Um, and I would say, actually, uh, I've Hand on heart, I've never used it in any of my rigs. I generally have a dedicated audio preamp and then a, a more, you know, beefy kind of uh, uh, audio finals that uh, like a TDA 2003 produces 10 watts, you know, if you really crank it up. But, but I thought, no, I'm trying to keep this simple, as simple as possible. So I went down the route of this. And actually, I was amazed, really, at how good this little chip performs if you build it carefully. You know, um, uh, if you don't, you'll get buzzing and clicking and hissing and all kinds of terrible stuff going on. But if you build it carefully, um, it, it's not bad at all. Uh, the gain is fixed, as I've put here, but it's actually controlled. You're controlling the level of the signal that's going into it um, here, there. So it's, it's very simple. Um, and so uh, here it is. And I've got a close up in a minute. Now, that's just an old, um, uh, it's an old 5.1 surround sound. Um, a speaker that I had lying around. I think it's four watt speaker. Um, uh, sorry, four ohm speaker. Sorry, um, but any four ohms, eight ohms will be, be fine. Uh, and you'll get a close up in a minute of this. Now, actually, funnily enough, <laughs> every module I built. And this is purely fluky, but it's very fortuitous for our purposes. Actually, I built using a different method of construction because there are different ways that you can scratch build, and this is using strip board. Um, which for audio uh, is absolutely fine. You wouldn't want to really build anything RF related on it, he says, as I mean, Bertie's built his first analog VFO on it. <laughs> because all those little strips on the back of it act as capacitors. And if you're trying to have a tuned circuit, it's going whoa, whoa all over the shop. Um, so, uh, but for audio stuff, it's absolutely fine. So that's a close up. Um, uh, and it's great for you can build really small with this kind of stuff. And if you've got pins, I mean, I soldered that that little IC straight in, but you can buy the little holders if you're scared about applying too much heat to it and then just solder the holder in and then plug the, the chip in afterwards if you if you want. Um, you may have noticed on the on the schematic before it's it's rated at being driven at nine volts. I like a lot of us run everything at 12 volts so i've got a little regulator circuit that um i'm pointing like you can see my 
<laughs> but a regulator circuit at the back end of that um, with a, a, a just a little regulator and a couple of capacitors. Um, so on the other side, that's what it looks like. Um, and um, I guess a lot of us have had a go at this. If you haven't, it's, it's pretty simple, really. Um, but you need to remember, if you're going to make connections between those traces, then make those connections. <laughs> I used to leave them all to the last minute and then forget one and then wonder why it's not working because I've got an open. Um, you need to use, it's like a little kind of braddle thing that you use to break the, the copper traces on, on the back, um, which you need to do, otherwise you'll be shorting things out. Um, and also you need to be careful with your soldering. Uh, this is not some of my finest work, but sometimes if you're piling up bits of solder, you can bridge one track with another and short stuff out as well, which um, uh, it never plays very nicely with anything. Um, but yeah, but yeah, pretty easy to do. And oh, we're going to have a little listen. So you might need to turn your volume up. And so this is um, uh, uh, listening to the audio stage when I built it and tested it. OK, well, here is the audio section. And um, I'm just going to press the play. Now I've got my iPhone here with a bit of um, Johann Sebastian on there. Uh, turn to about, you can probably just see, about a third of the volume uh, on the phone. So I'm just going to um, uh, press the play and tweak the volume on the, uh, on the audio app. So, as you can hear, um, there's a fair bit of gain there and really good um, sound uh, reproduction there. No hissing, buzzing, clicking, lots of the stuff that you often get um, with, those, um, with those chips sometimes. If you can, uh, if you can build it uh, carefully, then um, yeah, get some good results. So uh, that uh, is the, the audio stage. Right, and that's the beauty of those things. Um, uh, an audio stage, one thing I haven't got time to go into tonight, um, but is connected to all this stuff, is, is test equipment. And people often ask, what test equipment do I need to kind of do this? When I joined the meeting tonight, I think people were talking about nano VNAs. Um, I would definitely advise that you get a nano VNA, um, unless you happen to have um, <laughs> a really good spectrum analyzer or something, which most of us um, don't. Uh, it's a great little tool. Uh, and we'll come on to that uh, in a minute. Um, but yeah, um, so uh, product detector is next. Um, here we go. Now, and so I'm using uh, this is a little active double balance mixer chips, so the um, similarly common SA602612, sometimes called the NE602612. Um, a simple little thing, um, works pretty well. Uh, needs six volts, so uh, we're regulating that down. He's quite fussy about that as well. Um, so we've regulated that down and got a little um, 6.8 microhenry choke in the uh, in the feed line there, to just to keep any RF off the um, the power line. Um, and you remember, I said about we didn't have to worry about the uh, uh, the sum frequencies uh, from the from the mixer. Um, if you look down the bottom left-hand corner where it's AF out, that's a little filter there with that one millihenry choke, RF choke. So that will prevent uh, any of those RF frequencies from, from getting through. So you'll only get your audio that you want. Um, it's very simple. There's, it's just really a few capacitors. Now, I actually, you'll see in a minute, I actually built this in a different style. I'll talk about that in a second when you see it. Um, the only thing to mention here, which, which is a really important thing to grasp, actually, is about impedance matching. Now, when you're dealing just in audio work, it, this is not really such a big deal. The, the kind of rule of thumb is that as long as the, the stage that you're, you're feeding into has a, a larger, hopefully a much higher 
input impedance and the output impedance that you're feeding from, you're okay. You want to go from a low to a high. Um, but with RF, it does matter um, because maximum uh, signal transfer, uh, power transfer happens um, when the impedances are matched. Um, and I don't need to tell you guys about it. Your radio hams, you know, if you don't, we're talking about SWR, we're talking about reflected signal. So signal that you want to go through to the next stage, just like with a, a mismatched antenna, will end up being reflected back and be uh, go into heat and, and, and everything else. So um, you'll get much more out of your equipment if you can match the impedance. It doesn't have to be perfect. You know, it's amateur radio, um, but as close as you can get it. Now, this is easier, actually, with this little chip because... Um, it has a well-defined input and output impedance of um, 1.5 kilo ohms. Um, so what I just did is I built a little impedance transformer. Uh, they're very simple. It's just a little uh, uh, FT3743 toroid with 11 turns on it. And then I wound under two turns on top of that, on a number 28 enamel copper wire. And that will give you... Um, the uh, the right kind of impedance transformation uh, so that your RF coming in, which remember it is coming in from the bandpass filter, which we haven't built yet, will be 50 ohms thereabouts, and that will make sure it plays nicely then with the 1,500 ohms that the mixer is expecting to see. Um, so uh, so that's that. Now hopefully we're going to see it. Yeah. Now I built <laughs> I built a lot of these things in tins. Um, one because of this uh, talk, but more than that, because I do a lot of this modular stuff, when I'm just putting together ideas, I have a drawer full of these things with these different building blocks in. So I think I need a mixer, I open the drawer, get a mixer, I need a bandpass filter for 20 meters, I'll pull out a bandpass filter and you string them up. And it makes it, your prototyping so much quicker because you've got a lot of those parts there already. So if you're testing a new part, you can, you've got those building blocks already, you can stick into the, there. So I, I, you wouldn't necessarily have to build all these things in separate tins if you were doing one, one module. You could just have separate little boards and put them all into one enclosure, you know. Um, but for my purposes, it works quite well. Um, so here it is. Um, now this is built, I don't know what you'd call it. it. It's kind of a variant on what's known as the Manhattan style. Now the pure Manhattan style uses little pads that you glue down, um, uh, which are isolated from the ground plate. So your ground is that is that single sided copper board. So it, that's easy, you just solder them down to ground and anything else is, is it goes to the little pads. Um, I don't like the, I'm far too OCD to do too much ugly construction. <laughs> So, um, and I don't like things hanging around. I know Asher Farhan sent things up into space, built ugly construction. So, you know, it must be all right. But but for me, I, I'd rather have my anchored down to something more solid. Now, this is a variation on it. And I, I don't know what you call this, the engraving technique. Who knows? I bought a cheapy Chinese Dremel kind of thing. You know, one of these things for engraving and grinding and stuff. Um, it's like, like kind of pen attachment that you use. And because I saw some bloke on on one of the, uh, the 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 homebrew Facebook pages who who designed this, I thought, what a good idea! Rather than getting the super glue and gluing my fingers together all the time and, and sticking all these pads down, I could just you know mark out the the conductive pads which are, are going to be electrically isolated from the ground plane, and then it has the advantage, of course, everything's on the same level, so the same kind of pitch when you're putting things on. Uh, and they're not very expensive. And all, so all you do is you, you mark out where you want, you, you dremel them, and then you just tin those little pads and you make sure you go over it with a multimeter and make sure that you, you know, you, there's no stray little copper traces or anything. And, and yeah, works, works pretty well. You have to be careful. I did build one thing and I was getting loads of shorts and, and I think I put everything so flush to the ground. I was actually shorting some things out. So because it is one level, I, I got so blasé at, at having a, 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 like a millimeter or so play with these with these pads. Um, but uh, but anyway, so so there it is. Um, and um, yeah, it, you throw it together. And you can see here we've got, um, I, I like BNCs. Everybody has their own choice. I like BNCs because they're fairly cheap and easy to fit and they're easy to attach. You just twist them and, and put them on. Make sure you get the 50 ohms ones, not 75 ohm ones. Um, but there's a, a, an SMA there. You'll see why there's an SMA there um, coming from the local oscillator in a minute. And that's an audio jack there um, because we're taking audio from it and a power connector at the top. Right, I need to get a move on. Right, on to the local oscillator. Now, please don't be alarmed <laughs> at this next slide. Now, I could, and I've already confessed, 
you know, my um, um, uh, uh, tortured past of, of building analog VFOs, um, which uh, wasn't wholly successful, putting it mildly. Um, now, I could, and, and to build an analog VFO on one level is simple. To build it stable, um, uh, Tristan will remember, uh, last year, last time we had a, a, the, the GQRP club um, build-a-thon, we, we built one of George Dobbs's designs of a VFO. And um, we, um, so we built, we had a build-a-thon. We had, then we had a drift-a-thon then. <laughs> See, saw whose who's, uh, who's, who's VFO drifted more than the other ones, really, because they're, they're that easy to build, but not easy to, to build and be stable. So I went a different route. And the reason I went a different route is this the, is the route that I began with. I leapt straight into the deep end when I started building radio stuff and went into the, the route of using an Arduino and an SI5351 um, phase lock loop uh, signal generator module. Um, now, it, it looks confusing. It isn't actually. When you see it in a minute, there's hardly any wires. Now, this is, if, if you've never had a clay with an Arduino, again, I would advise you maybe put this stuff on pause for a bit, get yourself one. They're very cheap. Get them. Um, uh, and it's not a thing of, oh, I've got a cheap clone. They're all clones, most of them, <laughs> because it's a, you know, a uh, um, common source, uh, uh, open source design. Um, so lots of people build them um, and have a go, get some components. And, and there's loads of tutorials on the Internet about doing it. Get used to playing with them and um, getting the rotary encoder, turn it up and down, seeing the numbers go up and down and, and connecting your LCD screen and just get you familiar. Because, folks, if you can get this stuff down, this probably more than anything will really impact your building because you will get a rock solid um, uh, VFO here, far superior than anything that, that you, you could build uh, uh, otherwise. And it's not expensive. Those SI5351 chips, I think I bought three for a tenner from, from AliExpress the other day. So, I mean, they're, they're not expensive. Um, so, uh, now, the other thing to mention about this is if you look at this, this the LCD screen. Now, I didn't go down the route of flash TFT screens. I'm keeping it simple, right? And all this is doing, this is not offloading any uh, SDR stuff here. There's, there's, there's no jiggery-pokery wizardry going on. All this is doing is the Arduino is controlling the, the signal generator module. And, and we're, we're adjusting it with a rotary encoder, and we're seeing the results of it on the LCD screen. That's all it's doing, nothing else. And uh, what's really changed is all those little pins that, that are at the top on that representation of the LCD display. When I first started, you, you used to have to solder to every one of those pins and, and take every one to an Arduino pin. As you can see, I think it's 16 pins there. You don't have many pins left <laughs> to do anything else with. But, but you can get these great little converters that go on the back, which use what's called the I squared C or the I2C bus which is fantastic because there are only four connections. There's the, the power, which is either five volts or three, three volts. Uh, there's the ground, and then there's the data port, which is the orange one on my design, and the, the yellow one on my design, which is the clock, the clock and the data. Now, in actual fact, although the rotary encoder shows a clock and data, I'm not entirely certain whether that actually is purely I squared C. If you build it like this, it should work. But what I'm saying to you, certainly SI5351, certainly the LCD display, you could put your datas together. You could put your clocks together because the internal addressing is handled by the Arduino. Right? It sorts it out, right? And that's the great thing about it. So you don't need loads and loads of connections. Um, and so it looks like now. So I just breadboarded it, literally. Um, and, uh, yeah, what, what you will need to do, um, uh, you, you'll perhaps see on the, the bottom left, you see we're just using one port on the on the SI5351. It will produce three independent uh, signals if you want. Uh, if you're going to build a superhead, you'll use two of them. Um, where are you going to use one? You can see a number a little bit on, on, on that. You'll need to calibrate it, and there's a, there's a program that enables you to, to do that. Um, I have the code for this, which, again, I will make available to you. 
It's based very heavily. In fact, it pretty much is the work of Jason Mildrum, who, who pinched it from some other people and, and, and adapted it. Um, uh, and Jason Mildrum has got a, a, a calibration program as well. So you, if you install the Jason Mildrum SI5351 library, there's details in the, in the sketch of where to get it um, uh, from GitHub. Uh, that, that has the calibration program. And once you've calibrated it, it will be crack on. I mean, re really good. Um, and um, But uh, you, you can build it. In terms of testing it, yes, of course, if you've got an oscilloscope, great. If you've got some kind of spectrum tool that enables you to do it. One thing I use very often um, is is a little SDR play. I've got a, an old SP, uh, RSP2, but the, the, the cheaper ones, the RSP1As, or what, about £100, I don't know. Great little software defined radio. But also, there's a guy, I think it's called Steve Andrews, an Australian ham, who's written some software that turns it into a spectrum analyzer. I mean, obviously not as good as a Rigel or a Siglent, but, but, but will work. You'll need some kind of signal generator to put a signal in through it if you're testing something, um, but but works really well and will give you a really good idea about what you're looking at. So that's that's something to watch out for. Right. Okay. So that's the um, the thing. The last bit is the low pass filter. So now this is a screen grab of a piece of software called ELSI, E L S I E, which is a pun of course, on L and C, as in inductance and capacitance. And it's a software, a piece of Windows software for designing uh, tuned circuits, filters, basically. Um, so those of you that are familiar with this will know that the, the, the bookends, that the 50 ohm resistors on either end are not real 50 ohm resistors. You have to put those in. That just simulates the input impedance and the output load for the program. Uh, but, and essentially what it is, this is a three-pole Butterworth uh, bandpass filter um, that, that we're going to build. It, it, you'll notice stage one and stage three are identical. They're just two um, uh, parallel tuned circuits. And then stage two in the middle is, is a series tuned uh, circuit. Um, and uh, so that uh, was the LC thing. This is, now this looks a bit worse. This is only because I've listed every individual capacitor. <laughs> um, because um, uh, I made those capacitance levels up using a number of capacitors. You'll also note that I included in each stage a little trimmer capacitor. And that's because I wanted to have some variability and some control in the capacitance of each stage. Now, that's actually really important with bandpass filters. This is where you need your nano VNA, definitely. That, that is a godsend for the, that you can waste days <laughs> of your life fiddling around with these little blighters, right? B believe me. <laughs> um, so, uh, so if you've got something that could give you an idea of the shape and, and, and where that pass band is, like a nano VNA, is absolutely superb. So if you've got some variable uh, capacitance on either side, on, on these, these bookends, if you like, that controls, I don't know if you can see my hands here, but that controls where your filter lies. So if it's peaking too soon, you can shunt it up or shunt it back by controlling those. Now, the center one, the, the, the series tuned circuit, that controls the coupling. So now you, you might have seen sometimes when you see picture filters and it's got like twin peaks, <laughs> you know, um, which is a, a, a sign of an over coupled um, filter. There's too much capacitance in, in, in that uh, uh, in that capacitor that links those those two uh, end circuits, uh, uh, which you can actually tune down, right? Or you might see just a really one really sharp um, uh, thing, which is is an undercoupled one. So, um, uh, but you can actually uh, tweak that with a, if you've got a little trimmer with a screwdriver and get it spot on how how you want it. So it's very useful to kind of have that. Now. Uh, yeah, another box. Actually, what I would say is these little tins, I bought a load of these, about 20 of them, cheap from China, you know, um, but really useful. And they are good for, for bandpass filters because if you can get a bit of, um, you know, um, RF shielding on them, that's never a bad idea. Um, now, here they are. Now, forgive me, I have no idea what possessed me to build such thundering big cores. I don't know what how many watts I thought I was going to be putting through this bandpass filter. But anyway, you just kind of go with it. Um, so they you don't need to have cores as big as that. Um, but uh, but there it is. So that's what it looks like. And this uses the more traditional Manhattan style. You'll see 
uh, little bits of um, uh, a board that are cut up and glued um, on on top. Uh, it's not the prettiest thing in the world, but and that's because you have to keep it. It is when you first build it, but by the time you've ripped things off and put things back on again and resoldered it, it doesn't look great. Um, hence, if you're OCD like me, you can stick it in a tin once you've got it working, and uh, you don't have to look at it. <laughs> but at least it works well, um, which is the is the main thing. And and indeed it does. Uh, this was the LC prediction. So this is the 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 modeling software. This is what it predicts in an ideal world that filter will look like and this that i'm so get that fixed in your head because i'm going to show you now what it actually looks like so this is a screen grab from my nano vna so that's that was the predicted one this is the real one look at that okay let me go back again that was the predicted that's reality right uh less than one db insertion loss you know for for, <laughs> for a home brew filter that's pretty darn good, you know, so I was, I was well pleased with that. Now you'll see the skirts are not very steep. That's partly because it's only a three pole filter. It's also partly because it's a Butterworth filter and Butterworth filters give you a nice kind of uh, even plane, if you like, through the, through the, uh, uh, the, the, the actual kind of band pass bit of it, if you like. Um, through the pass band, thank you. Um, but but actually, they're, they're not so steep. Now, you could build a different design. You could build something like a Chevy Chev design. Now, that has much steeper, sharper skirts, but you will get some ripple then in the pass band. So it's horses for courses. There's no perfect thing. You have to decide what, what you want to live with, really. Um, sharper skirts or or um, and and more ripple or, or not so much attenuation, but, but a smoother... Um, kind of filter in the pass band. So finally, when you connect these four models together and you add an antenna for 80 meters, what do you get? Well, da, 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 something like this. Okay, so this is it. Um, just strung together, as you can see, with just some um, uh, BNC uh, cables. And um, that is our uh, direct conversion receiver. And of course, the um, the million dollar question is, <laughs> does it actually work right well judge for yourself so there's a, just a two or three minutes here now just to finish of of footage of me tuning across the 80 meter band with this rig and remember although it sat on top of my sdr it's the it's the uh the direct conversion receiver and that alone that you're listening to Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, nice chatting anyway, and uh, uh, I wish you a good evening. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for listening. Uh, as I said, there is a PDF version of this presentation available, including, well, everything you've seen, all the photos and schematics and everything. And if anybody would like uh, the Arduino code, then you're very um, welcome to have it. Uh, you can contact me at uh, that email address, m0ntv at nickthevic.co.uk. Uh, or, uh, or if, if you can't remember that, if you hit me up on QRZ, then there's a, there's my email address on there as well. Um, and just to say, if you're interested, please uh, do check out my other kind of homebrew adventures on my new uh, YouTube uh, uh, a video channel that I've got called M0NTV Homebrewing. So thank you very much. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I will do my best to answer them. Thank you. Oh, fantastic, Nick. Very, 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 very well done. Yeah, thank you very much, Nick. Very, very enjoyable. A bit, a bit too technical for me at times. I'm afraid. If you can knit that. it, if I can knit it or crochet <laughs> it, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Well, it's more than I can. I can knit it or crochet. That's for sure. Can I, can I, can I stress something, Nick? Whenever you do something, make notes write it down because at some point you're going to come back to the circuit and say why did i change that resistor from what's written down yeah absolutely and how <laughs> much what voltage should i get out of it well i've written down 1.3 volt two years ago and why is it not as it is now absolutely i couldn't i couldn't agree more steve and actually that i've got a massive unfortunately it would have been easier maybe if i'd i'd been a bit more organized and had a book or something but i've generally they're loose leaves but i do every now and then so particularly if i do something like um uh transceiver which is loads of different modules and maybe i'll change my mind a few times i've got a whole file for that and think oh didn't i use something in that other rig so i can go back and look at it but you're absolutely right make notes you know even if it doesn't work you know, especially if it doesn't work you know make make notes yeah, why doesn't it work <laughs> yeah so you suddenly read something which will tell you oh that's why it doesn't work yeah yeah, yeah. for sure thank you that's very good advice yeah, there's a, a message from uh, DK, DK Philbin. Uh, yep. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, he says. Uh, hang on from Steve to everyone. Thanks so much, Steve. I've been building a lot of kits, mostly from QRP labs, and have learned so much about radio building and troubleshooting those. The stuff you spoke about today seems the next logical step for me. I enjoyed it very much from Steve. W5RRX, Las Cruz, New Mexico in the US. Thank you, Steve. I think yeah. Rachel's got a question before then about have I any preferred sources of information? Um, that's a very good question. Um, uh, yes, uh, I think, uh, I mean, the, the well, where do I start? Really? I, probably one of the one of the best places to start uh, uh, if you want to start doing some of this stuff uh is to if you're not if you're not a member of the gqrp club um is, is to join uh they they have a, a fantastic magazine called sprat which has uh, simple little design well, sometimes not so simple designs in that you can use they also have a um what's well, a memory stick now with all the back issues on so there's every conceivable kind of thing you could ever want to build which is good if you want something more uh moving on pete giuliano uh, n6qw uh, as um, well, he's got about three websites, but he he, he builds some things and has, has documents them very well. And the great thing about Pete, I mean, he's probably the most prolific home brewer alive in the world today. I think it's probably fair to say um, in terms of building SSB transceivers. Uh, but he is, and, and for somebody who has done so much, he is so generous with his time. And I I emailed him when I didn't know 
one end of a transistor from the other and, and asked and he was <laughs> so patient and, and uh, helpful to me you know uh, and and so th that's a good one so if you if you google n6qw um you you'll find pete stuff if you if you're a bit more advanced and you want something to to go on then charlie morris zl2ctm from new zealand is superb but he won't hold your hand <laughs> and you have to follow what he does and but he'll he'll go through it all and he'll show you out and he'll work out he'll calculate things and stuff um but that's a bit bit a bit harder um i'm trying to think of us oh um peter parker uh vk3 ye from um from australia lots of lots of of, of good yeah yes i mean <laughs> funnily enough that's hey tristan hang on thank you chair <laughs> snap yes i've um i'm working my way through it um uh, and the, there are lots of it i mean it's, it's not the easiest of things i have to say to i mean if, if you know a little bit it's it's really helpful um, i'm not sure it's quite beginners but what i am a there? i am a physicist or was <laughs> oh well you'll be fine <laughs> you'll be absolutely fine in fact you probably want you want them you want the big boy i've got Experiment. that it's, look at that tome there experimental <laughs> methods you know this was um uh wes haywood's next one. After, after this, this was about, wes haywood's yeah. next one which the age of rl have now reissued they've not i had to get this it cost me an arm and a leg this is 1986 original last edition you can't get these these you yeah. can get you can, you can get them with a cd with all the pdfs of lots of other stuff as well so that's um that's a, another good one thanks Nick. Uh, that's all right um i'm trying was it's, but if you can join a few um i don't know if you're on facebook or anything like that there's there's loads of like homebrew sites and things where people and actually if you need some help and advice that's quite a, a, a friendly place to be as well where people won't hopefully shoot you down and uh, and will be quite kind and helpful hopefully that's something that kd9 is it sorry kd7 pxb what sources do you use search research for design information i think you've answered that though haven't you nick with yeah Rachel. i mean at the moment i mean i say about um uh, charlie morris being a bit uh, uh kind of uh next level but actually at the moment he's doing a series on building simple um, which is uh, uh, and so it's really stripping it back and simple and going through every stage in a modular way uh so actually that's probably not a bad thing even if you don't get everything i mean uh it's it's not a bad place to start i one from robbie g zero g u h many thanks nick for an interesting presentation good explanation of sideband inver inversion in the mixer well done robbie thank you that took me years to understand that <laughs> that's, that's that's why i have to tell everybody about sideband inversion now i finally understand it you know <laughs> Um, Alan Drury from our club, what sort of range will the VFO produce? Could yeah, you use very... it as a signal generator project? Absolutely. Yeah, very good question. Now, uh, uh, Trist, you might be out yeah. uh, it, It's It's actually quite a low frequency, up to about, is it it's about 160 megahertz it's supposed to go up to? So it's, it's it covers all the um uh, yeah all the amateur frequencies and a, a fair old chunk of of uh, well up to technically up to the two meter band uh now you will find obviously that it will drop off a bit um <laughs> more than a bit perhaps as, as you get up there but it is actually good and people have built and there are a number of designs actually for building your own signal generator using one of those chips and in, in all truth the little um, VFO that I've showed you is pretty much that. I mean, all right, it'll only produce a square wave, which is what what it will. But I mean, you could filter that and, and produce a sine wave if you wanted, um, and uh, and you could actually use that um, uh, to actually uh, to test some of your mixes um, uh, by by putting signals through it because you can actually you can in the code you'll see you can comment certain bits out so. You, you can set it up to just produce one signal on the, what you see is what you get, you know, as they call it, for direct conversion. But you can actually do an IF offset as well. So that actually on your counter, it might say three 
800, but you're not really at 300. You might have a, a you know an IF much higher than that, but it'll actually do the calculation and show you something more intelligible. Um, but yeah, it's a clever little bit of kit for not very much money. Yeah, I mean, I've got I've got one here, Nick. Um, What's it go down to, Tristan? It's uh, low, isn't that, it? Yes, yeah, low, but it's not like uh, you can't get down to audio frequencies. No, 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 no. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, that's got a little Arduino Pro um, at this end here. Oops, there, and then a little LCD display, and then there's the um, silicon um, the chip itself. Like you said, it's got three different outputs to it. Where am I? Over here. Um, which you can select independently. So if you wanted to create a, a super hat, you can do, can't you, Nick? Yeah. Because you just squirt out the uh, the IF frequency out yeah. of uh, that one and end. Truth, it, it's not that difficult. And actually, all it means, really, is building, effectively, another mixer, which we'll use as the first mixer, possibly an RF amplifier or two if you want a bit of IF amplification and a crystal filter, and then you've got a, a super head. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot better than this uh, drifty VFO that I made at the Builderthon. <laughs> um, and you, you can see all the bits of uh, slug tape I put on top of it to try and improve it, um, but it was still dreadful. And, well, I, uh, I even got the, the – they even gave me the, uh, the, poly, the um, uh, polystyrene capacitors – um, but the one that won just had the cheapy, cheapy rubbish one. So who knew, you know? Uh. Well, mine was Jinx because it, it was board number 13. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, was, it was, or was it 31? I'm not sure. It was unlucky, <laughs> unlucky for me anyway. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Right. From DK uh, Philbin, who is KD60K. Excellent presentation. I'm looking forward to your talk about converting this direct conversion receiver to a super head. That's off uh, DK. Well, uh, hopefully we'll be locked down for a lot longer, won't we, Nick? Then we'll be able to come <laughs> back. Well, I've, I've, been, I've pretty much built the super head. I've just got to prepare the talk. So, so, <laughs> so I, am moving, I am moving house, actually, um, later this year. So maybe in the autumn or winter or something. <laughs> Ashley Roy, uh, good evening all. My glass runs are dry and I need to get to the off licence before the shoot. <laughs> <laughs> good night, Tom. That sounds about right for Ash. Hi, yeah. Tom. Yeah. Good, good night, Ash. Ash. Take yeah, care. Night, Lawrence. Tom. Enjoy. Yeah, thanks, Nick, for an inspiring talk from uh, G4KLT. Yeah, well, well done, Nick. Yeah, I think everybody seems to have enjoyed it. Well, I'm pleased. I'm pleased. Thank yeah, you very much. Yeah. And, if, and if Ash has run out of beer... That is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, th thank, thank you ever so much, Nick, for um, giving your time to us and the uh, in your uh, very entertaining style as well. And the slides works fantastically. And I, I, look, I love the little arrow going really slowly, you know, to the AF <laughs> bit, where you're sort of squirting out to the, uh, to the speaker, which is the technical uh -huh. term. And um, you, you brought uh, joviality uh, and entertainment to... Uh, to uh, what could potentially be quite a dull subject, uh, but you really brought it to life. So I hope that it'll inspire um, some of our viewers, uh, some of our members uh, to have a bit of a go at building, you know, little direct conversion receivers and, uh, and really getting the bug ready for making stuff. So thank you ever so much, Nick. You're very welcome. No, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's, it's been great. Thanks.